Okay, good afternoon. We're back. Mayor's imagining the just city. And we're going to conclude our time together with our second panel on Just Cities Infrastructure and the College Town. I can only imagine people here in Cambridge might be interested in um, mayors and colleges. So I'm delighted to um, bring to the stage Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway from Madison, Mayor LeVar M. Stoney from Richmond, and Mayor Patrick L. Wohan. I don't know why my tongue gets tired. Wohan, my apologies, from College Park, Maryland. So let's welcome them to the stage. Uh, and again, those of you who are watching online, uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat and we'll integrate them at the end of our panel. So um, I hope you've had a chance to look at your pens and have <laughs> Uh, uh, and prepared for that question when it comes up. Ready, Tony. <laughs> um, but I'd like to start um, this panel the same way we started the last, by having you each paint a picture of your city today in the context of the just city. And you know what makes it just today? Are there aspects of your city that are just? And what are some of the more pressing challenges of injustice that you like to talk about? So Maya Wahan, you're looking me dead in my eyes. So let's go ahead and start All right. with you. Happy to start. So, Thank you. So Patrick Wyan, Mayor of the City of College Park in Maryland. We are uh, the home of the flagship campus of the University System of Maryland. We're located just outside of Washington, DC in Prince George's County. And uh, where are the conditions of uh, injustice in our city, the, the, what we are struggling against is a long legacy of dealing with many of the same things that communities all over the United States have dealt with. Uh, the, the legacies of redlining, the legacies of segregation, uh, the legacies of, of centuries of discrimination uh, and, and, and okay, occasionally brutal violence against uh, uh, people of color. Uh, and uh, the the impacts that that still has today in College Park, in particular, uh, we were uh, we have a historic African American community, the community of Lakeland, uh, that was uh, largely displaced. About two thirds of the residents were displaced by urban renewal in the 1970s and 1980s, and that was a, a thriving uh, African American community um, uh, that uh, had a had. A, had a great culture, had uh, schools that were integrated, uh, uh, that was really just devastated when um, it started uh, in part because of a lack of investment um, that led to blight, that led to, there was a stormwater problem, a lot of stormwater problems that led to flooding in the community. Many of the homes uh, in Lakeland were vacant. And they, um, they came to the city asking for assistance in, in addressing these conditions. Uh, the city, uh, didn't didn't work with the community to address these conditions. They basically imposed uh, this uh, policy of urban renewal, um, bought up many of the properties, uh, replaced them with with uh, uh, apartments that later on became student housing, largely, uh, and uh, and made um, part of that uh, whole section of the community into a recreational area, Lake Artemisia. Uh, which uh, um, is now a great benefit to the community, but but was that was built on top of the homes of uh, people who were displaced. Uh, what we are doing to address these conditions, uh, the this history of injustice, uh, is we're we're pursuing a number of different practices in the city of, of College Park. We uh, have been part of the Go government alliance on race and equity that has really helped us to look at at our policies through a lens of racial equity. Uh, um, but and we are. And we committed in 2020 upon the advocacy of uh, current residents of Lakeland to, to adopt and embrace restorative justice and pursue and begin this long process of pursuing restorative justice for the residents of Lakeland, the current residents, as well as the people who are displaced. Uh, so in the last several months, we've been engaging in that process, setting a roadmap forward, uh, and p p coming to, to this, being part of this program was part of that effort, really looking at how we can how we can engage with the community to to create that roadmap to to invest in the community in a way that will that will sustain it, uh, that will preserve its legacy, uh, that will strengthen it, uh, and give uh, the resources that Lakeland needs to to thrive. Mayor Stoney. Well, you know, um, <laughs> Richmond has sort of always been 
uh, a home for a lot of history, a lot of American history. Um, and that American history is a little, um, a little tortured. It's uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as I like to say. Um, there's a lot of good in the, in the history books about what the role that Richmond played. Uh, but a lot of times we, we, we tend to gloss over the fact that this place was not always good to a lot of his residents. Um, I love my city, but also I love the fact that we're taking steps to sort of um, confront some of those injustices head on. Uh, not too dissimilar to, to, to Charleston, uh, Richmond was the second busiest domestic slave port in the United States of America. A lot of black and brown, a lot of black families uh, can find their roots in the city of Richmond. Um, we were the uh, the biggest, um, I guess you could say that the 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 leader of disinformation post the Civil War. Remember, Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. Um, and when we talk about misinformation, we talk about the lost cause, from textbooks to Confederate monuments. In Richmond, we did it big. We did it big. Um, and those, when I think about the monuments, I think post the Civil War, yes, the North won, but the leaders in the South uh, continue to tell a different story about uh, their role and what sort of role the government was going to play in the lives of the marginalized. And I think you saw that in our, you can see that in our infrastructure, you can see that in our built environment, you can see that uh, in sort of the dis disparities that lie between black residents and white residents. And so the work that I've been focused on is knowing that race has always bubbled underneath the surface in Richmond, how do I build a better life for every Richmonder? The newcomers, but also those who are what I call legacy residents. Those who lived in thriving black neighborhoods like Jackson Ward and uh, and in Churchill, uh, we yes we began by removing those Confederate monuments through, from throughout our landscape. All of them gone, um, disposed to uh, we 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 convey those monuments to the Black History Museum. I think there's a little poetic justice with that. <laughs> um, but we also recognize after the, the the murder of George Floyd that we got to do a little bit more than just symbolism, as Mayor Day talked about. Uh, we have to center every policy decision that comes out of government around equity and around justice. And we've done that, whether it's social justice, whether it's environmental justice. Uh, we think that uh, our equity agenda which lays out nine major uh, initiatives that we're gonna, we're gonna make over the course of not just my term, but hopefully something that can be adopted way beyond um, my time as mayor. And I will tell you this, Richmond is not the same place it was, heck, five years ago, 10 years ago, definitely not 50 years ago. We're a more welcoming, more inclusive place. And I always say it's either the first stop of the south, uh, of the south or the last stop of the north. Yeah. That's what we're, what we're becoming. And I'm proud of my city and the, and the steps that we're taking. Well, Tony, there's probably 20 different ways that I could answer that question. Um, but as I was listening to the, the previous panel, um, you know, there's a few things that, that really just jumped out at me in thinking about Madison and, and the questions of justice. Um, it, Madison started a process around race and equity probably Oof. It's probably almost 10 years ago now um, when, and you know, there's so many layers and ironies to all of this, right? When, when finally a white-led organization did a data analysis on how inequitable Madison was with respect to race and outcomes. And so this is, you know, these are all things that, it, the black community have been saying right. for years, right? But it took a, a white-led, sort of more official organization to put out a report and say, you know, we are experiencing deeply inequitable outcomes in our community. 
and um, and the white community freaked out, right? At, at, oh my God, this is so bad. We didn't realize how bad it was. <laughs> Oi. Um, <laughs> but what good. What to do, what to do. What to do, what to do, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? Like, it, it, all that. But also, like, yes, good, right? Good. That people finally were at a place where they were upset about this and yeah. could see it in front of them uh, in a way that they hadn't before. And so that... That changed a lot of things in Madison, and and changed a lot of the conversations, um, and uh, started the uh, too slow process of redirecting resources. Uh, but it also started a process internal to the city that I want to spend just a, a moment on because I hope for some of the students in the room that. It, your careers will take you, perhaps, yes, into elected office, but, but perhaps even more importantly, into staff positions in government. Um, and because the, the racial equity work that's happening within the city of Madison government um, started and is still primarily led by city staff. It's not, and we, we do now have a, um, a director of our division of uh, equity and social justice, and she's fantastic and she's doing great work, but it's not just people whose jobs have racial equity in the title, right? It is. It was people in public health, it was people in planning, it was people in finance, it was, and these people led the work and are still leading the work and are really, you, there was a question earlier about how do you embed this, right, beyond the term of a politician, will you, you do that by having staff be committed to the work uh, or to the project and to carrying it through um, over political transitions. And so, so I say that because I want to encourage you to think about government service as an opportunity to do this work, not just as elected uh, officials, but, but also in staff. And I also say this to say that the city of Madison is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> And so. <laughs> the pitches begin. Yes. The, the, as always but, happens when we have but I, the fill officials in the building. But the, uh, the, the one other thing that I want to say about Madison and our, our journey around justice is that I think Madison and the community is a community deeply committed to justice and deeply conflicted about what justice means. Okay. Perfect setup for me because I have a triangle of topics that you all have raised that are connected. I'm going to try to at least put them in the room so that maybe you guys can help me make sure we address them. So this notion of um, the language and the values, right? So on the one hand, I want to ask you all about the pens, you, the values you chose to wear on your pen and how it relates to your city. But each of you went straight for putting racial equity, equity, race and equity, and restorative justice in your opening remarks. The first panel used more uh, very specific values about your city. Each of you consistently used justice, racial justice, restorative justice, equity, racial equity. So I'm going to ask you to um, help us be sure that you see clear distinctions between those terms and how easy is it for you to use them publicly as you're doing this work. So that's one mm. question. The other thing that you guys raised that is also a thread from the, the first one because it came up and popped up a little bit in our work this week that I didn't get a chance to put, lean into more, but narratives, misinformation, lost histories, erased histories. And I know this panel is about college towns, but you know we're finding now many colleges are starting their programs and the acknowledgement of native lands that they're sitting on and all the sort of extractions and takings <laughs> that they've done. Um, and the ways in which you know campuses whitewash and erase place, et cetera. And now we've had this movement of the erasure of the American histories that have done the harm. I actually 
actually sit in a place where I'm not so convinced that that's always the tactic to take, right? What What's missing is something alongside of what gave that meaning, right? So the issues of erasure versus additive, complete histories is always a fascinating and I know controversial one. So I'm wanting to tie that, you know, as a part of our college town discussion and maybe, you know, are your anchor institutions grappling with this as you are doing this kind of work, right, in your cities as, as specifically as you are, for example, and maybe it's coming up at University of Maryland and University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin. Um, what are the type of entanglements that might be going on between institutions and you all, both who are keepers, holders of the public realm and narratives in the public realm? And then the thing that runs tangential to both of those things is who gives or what gives legitimacy to the acknowledgement uh, and the redress of social justice and equity. So I'm putting those all out. We are at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> you are at Harvard. Should Mama, we answer I'm at Harvard. In, in essay form? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, like, whoa. so, like, I'm sorry. I said I just wanted to put those out there because I didn't want to forget. Okay, now, okay, now I'm going to come right. back. <laughs> so let's start with let's start with the the values and the language. You've each talked about really. Ex you, you haven't just left it off with equity. You're talking about racial equity, racial justice, restorative justice. How easy or hard has it been for each of you to lean into that as a part of your vision as a mayor and day-to-day -day grind and slog with your constituency, but also with your staff, right? Because you hire your, your cabinet members, but you've got people who've been there 30 years who are just waiting for the next wave of leadership to come in. So talk about it through all of those slices. Easy, hard to use this language yeah. with sincerity and authenticity. So it's, just to be totally, completely, and brutally honest about this, it because is- Because you haven't, you've been really you, shy. I know, because I'm time. super shy about all the things. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting, right? So I, um, I feel that in Madison, um, it is both really easy to talk about race and equity and also um, almost required and in a way that, that it can become performative, okay. right? Um, because uh, we have been doing this work and having this conversation both um, externally within the community and internally within the city, um, it's, it, is at times, um, you know, deeply real and important. And uh, you know, I could talk uh, for hours about the ways in which we're embedding questions around equity into our budget making and into our projects and into our engagement. And, and that's real. Um, and it is mostly um, very much accepted by city staff, not universally, but mm -hmm. mostly. Um, and also, like, kind of not optional for them. <laughs> um, uh, but also, uh, there are ways in which, in our, our community dialogue, um, it does become very performative. Um, uh, and uh, really more like, uh, well, you know, we have to talk about equity and, uh, and or you are doing a thing that I don't like, and so I'm going to call that inequitable. When it maybe isn't really, it's just I don't like it, <laughs> um, and so that's that's part of why I, I name that I think we don't agree on what justice is, mm -hmm. um, and that's really I think a lot of the tension in Madison right now is the is figuring out how do we um, you know sort of get past those that performance and into to some real questions about tangible. justice. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, I'm glad that uh, that you started with this because, with the performative piece, because, you know, um, sometimes I hear more of my white residents and my white leaders talk about inequity, talk about uh, injustice more than I hear some of my black leaders do. I told a story uh, during my presentation about how when I 
Maybe I didn't tell this story. I've, I've said it so many times. When I was seeking just to have the, dis the debate, the discussion about the removal of the monuments, there were some of my black leaders in town who said, what are you doing? We've worked so hard to, uh, to have s some harmony in this city, it's and you are bringing all this stuff. stuff back up mm -hmm. unnecessarily. And I said, well, I think government leadership is about righting wrongs, right? And if we know this is wrong, shouldn't we say something about it? And that made them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I, I use equity a lot, but the word that I really use a lot is opportunity. Because the reason we have all the inequities and all the injustices is because they're all barriers to opportunity. I believe you can't have opportunity without equity. And you should see my social media pages <laughs> because all the right-wing trolls will come there and say, every time you say something, Mayor, all I hear is black, 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 blackity, black, black, black. <laughs> I hear it all the time. And I say, I mean, I ignore that obviously, but there are some folks who don't want to face the facts that, you know, we all didn't start on the same base. And so we got to do a little bit more for certain neighborhoods when it comes to even the simplest things like collecting the trash mm -hmm. or paving a road. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got neighborhoods in my city that had not seen paving in 40, 50 years. So essentially, someone in government said it was okay for these individuals to live this way. And what my administration is, is saying is that equity to us is saying that's wrong, that's not fair, and no one should have to live this way. And so that's about, I mean, we can touch on, that can touch on so many topics, right? The lack of parks, the lack of trees, the lack of sidewalks. That to me is the real, when I talk about my equity agenda and how that's the center of all our work now that we do, it's just saying, you know what, we all have known this, this, is wrong. this has been wrong. No one's been able to actually step up and say we should do something about it. And here's the thing. I also will have to say this, to add to what Mayor Rose Conway said, the murder of George Floyd was, some say, a flashpoint that led to an awakening in this country and in a lot of many of our cities. But we cannot ignore the fact that this was going on way before, mm. right? I, the work that I get to do today, I get to do because there was a pioneer, there was a, a forerunner before me that allows me to stand on his or her shoulders. Right. And these individuals pointed out what was wrong already. Mm. So I appreciate all the activists who found, uh, who, who, you know, Self-growth is good, mm -hmm. and that's positive, that folks were saying, I want to join you in the fight. But there are folks who pointed out these inequities and fought against these inequities way before that flashpoint in our history. So Mayor Mohan, I was really fascinated by your project, and I think we all sort of leaned into and admired uh, the product you brought that really centered restorative justice. Did that come from the community and you embraced yeah. it? Did it come from inside your cabinet alongside of community? So it, it, it did come from the community and it was in the wake of the murder of George Floyd that they really came to us and they said, it is time that the city of College Park deal with this legacy. And I, I think there were a number of factors that, that caused that to, that caused us to embrace it at that time as well. If, it, if, that, if that had happened 10 years earlier, I don't think we would have embraced it in the way that we have now. Um, with the, but over the last several years, uh, we've, been, we've been working, we've been talking, starting to get the conversation about racial equity mm -hmm. uh, with the leadership of organizations like the National League of Cities, and I mentioned the Government Alliance on Race and Equity before, uh, to, to have, com have conversations about that. I won't say that everybody on my council and that everybody in our community you know gets it by any means but we've started to just say we just need to we just need to do this and and uh, we also uh, you met you asked about our staff before um, when I became mayor in 2015 every single one of our senior staff members was white 
and uh, I hired we, we hired a new uh, city manager just about three or four months before I became mayor. And I sat down with that city manager and said, this is something, this is a problem that we need to fix. We need to make sure that our staff uh, on every level is looking more like our community. Um, so we've we've steadily changed that over time. Um, there's still we still have a lot of legacy senior staff, but 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 we but our staff is getting more and more diverse. And we have, last year we hired our, our first racial equity officer. Uh, so having having a diverse uh, staff on all levels has really helped us to the the staff. We don't have to spend as much time and effort explaining to our staff why this is important. Uh, because a lot of a, a lot of folks, and especially having the racial equity officer on board, you, you understand it. So I'm going to lean into the sort of college town dynamic of this panel, and I want to stay in the people space first before I go back to the place um, place for um, in the second part of this, um, and ask you to talk about this notion of justice. Um, as it relates to the populations of college towns, which can be transient because students come in and out, faculty come in and out. Um, and have you seen these, um, how have those populations sort of mashed up against the populations of your city? And does that amplify the conditions of racial justice or how people of difference are treated or or acknowledge, I mean, even within the sub-communities of universities, right, and I'll even speak for my own school, you know, we have a diverse population here within the context of a uh, pedagogy that is rather homogeneous, right? And so different communities within our school look for ways to find themselves in their in identity. I wonder how that just plays out on the streets of the city and as mayors, is that something that you see happening as a complement or tension? And how are you in conversation with the institutions about those kinds of dynamics? Well, so, it, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Relationship status. Um. That's Facebook for some of y'all who <laughs> only well, use TikTok. I'm, I'm, I'm question presumes relationship and presumes healthy enough to engage. So if I'm off no, base I, on that, I, please I, modify. I mean, it, so, I mean, Madison is, is um, in so many ways quintessentially a college town, right? The campus is so much a part of who we are as a city. It's such a large um, part of our population. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so, um, of course, right? Of course, there's there's huge impact. There's um, there's so much back and forth. So many people come to Madison because of the university and stay, right? Um, but also, you know, so many people come to the university and don't stay. Mm -hmm. And there are really marked differences in in the demographics of who stays and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that is one thing that we wrestle with as a community. How do we just to be completely, you know, because I'm shy and retiring, uh, blunt about it, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, we wrestle with as a community, and I think campus also really deeply wrestles with how do we not just attract but retain mm -hmm black professionals mm -hmm. in Madison. We're not doing a good job of it right now. Um, and I think that that, that is a question that, that sort of bounces between not just community and campus, uh, but community and other large institutions and businesses who are all asking the same question. Yeah. Um, and also, um, you all will appreciate, I hope, this, that, you know, People who are in academia often feel that they are expert in many things, um, which can be challenging in engaging around things around government. I love watching you wrestle with this. This is fantastic. <laughs> Just, you know, offer an example of a recent project. We're trying to put sidewalks in in a neighborhood. 
and there's very many people who are very well educated who feel very strongly about this. Um, but it's so it's good, right? It's great because we tap the uh, the knowledge and intelligence that lives on campus in so many ways yeah. to the benefit of the community, yeah. and also it can be contentious. Yeah. Right. And and it, and it lives. You know, because I know you're going back to, to geography and space and design, um, it it to me it's so interesting to reflect on how the presence of the university impacts the fabric of the city, and and in Madison it it expresses as east versus west, yeah. and east is industry and townies, and west is campus. Yeah and professionals, and that is yeah. deeply embedded yeah. in Madison's identity. And it, 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 it makes me think about my own undergraduate experience, right? because universities are communities within a community, right? They operate like communities alongside a community, and there's not much that the university does to make me feel like I'm a citizen of the city in which the, com the, the university is in. And for some reason, this is just kind of coming into yeah. focus to me, and, and suggesting a new kind of dialogue around even how we spatially plan, but just the integration of this. Because in the end, you know, cities would welcome retaining yes. graduates as a part of their economic growth, as a part of being a part of their communities. Yes. And could that start at the undergraduate level where you're getting students to really embrace what it means to be of the city yeah. as well as the university? But let's hear from Richmond and College Park. Uh, you, I would say that you were masterful on how you navigated <laughs> what you wanted to say. I mean, I remember uh, uh, where Mayor Larson talked about those town halls, and p we know people who come to these town halls who are professionals about uh, their uh, opposition. Well, sometimes they may come from the universities, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, we are, Richard would not be where it is today if it wasn't for our institutions of higher education. Um, our flagship, you know, the flagship university that we're known for, Virginia Commonwealth University, but we have four institutions of higher ed located inside the city limits. And I, will, I believe that sometimes the students and the faculty have been ahead of the city mm -hmm. when it comes to equity and justice or just being more progressive minded mm -hmm. about where the city should go. Mm -hmm. um, I would not be the mayor if it wasn't for those students and, and the members of the faculty. And I just have to point out that, that maybe I need to um, distinguish between the university as an administrative yes. body Good. and faculty within schools like ours who actually do do work um, and, and see the city like as laboratory and place of study and scholarship, right? So yes. point taken there. Yeah. And, and, and I, I believe it's the mayor's job to, you know, when the, when the university says that this is all we can do, our job is to say, no, I think you can do a little bit more than that, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I'm proud that uh, Virginia Union <laughs> University, which is a uh, historically black college in my city, is giving full paid scholarships mm -hmm. to middle schoolers, lifting you know, a lot of these kids out of poverty, mm -hmm. going through Richmond Public Schools. Uh, VCU is working with me on how to fight back against gun violence in my city. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're also uh, a research institution, research hospital as well, to have that alongside mm -hmm. you know, in the fight against gun violence. So they are, we are more intertwined as a community than we used to be. Okay. It used to be, that's VCU over there, don't encroach on my neighborhood, mm -hmm. or, and here's the thing, the, the students sometimes still look at the city and the institution as the big bad bo boogeyman, you know, mm -hmm. right? We are, you know, our neighborhoods are gentr gentrifying because of the university. I've heard that one before. Yeah. And what are you gonna do to hold VCU accountable, yeah, right? And so <clears throat> we're lucky enough that at the beginning in, in 2010, a third of VCU graduates were staying in the city. Now over half wow. are choosing oh, wow. to stay in the city. Wow. So I, I believe the university is a, the lifeblood of the city right now. But we also got to recognize that they do play a role yeah. in our changing neighborhoods. Yeah. Jackson Ward, what I talked about earlier, yeah. uh, which is you know, a historically black neighborhood, 
VCU has a role, has played, has played a role in that city, in that area of the city changing. Yeah. And, and, and Mayor, for you, um, as you talk about College Park and University of Maryland, which also has a really large and prominent architecture school, any, in, you know, if there are ways to weave in you know, their role or, or yeah. participation with you kind of either separate or alongside the university at large. Yeah, yeah, so the University of Maryland has a fraught relationship, has a fraught history uh, with uh, issues of, of race. Uh, was a segregated institution uh, up until the mid 20th century. There were some of the, the, the like landmark names that are associated with the University of Maryland fought to keep it as a segregated institution. And, and, uh, and uh, recently, it's really kind of struggled with. Although I mean, there are many of us in the community who would like to see the university be be more of a of a of a of a tool of an avenue for members of our community to uh, to to be lifted up, to be elevated, to receive a great education. Um, and and um, I, talking about Lakeland, well, well, the University of Maryland was a segregated institution. It was the residents of Lakeland, the African American residents of Lakeland, who were often providing um, facilities, maintenance, uh, employees, helping build the university and helping it to become what it is today. Uh, the the university provides a tutoring program where they work with students at Paint Branch Elementary School, which is the elementary school in Lakeland, and one uh, one uh, person who lives in Lakeland who went through that program. Uh, was recently talking at a forum, and she and she pointed out that, to her knowledge, no person who ever was tutored by students at the University of Maryland in that program, the Lakeland Stars program, it's called, had ever gone on to study at the University of Maryland, which was really striking to me. This is an institution right across the street; they can see it, they see it every day, but but it is inaccessible to many of them, and still is. So one thing, when we started to talk about restorative justice for Lakeland, one thing I wanted to be sure is that the university is at the table for those discussions, for that process, that we have people who are, are decision makers at the university who can, who can be engaged to learn about that history and understand that they do play a role in what has happened in Lakeland in the past. They can play a, a role in, in ensuring that we're successful in, in pursuing restorative justice in Lakeland. So let me, and maybe with my last question, then again, open it up to those who are watching online and, and folks in the room, back to um, um, the built environment. Um, and I maybe want to situate the question um, around the public realm, which depending on how your campus um, is situated within your city can sometimes be very seamless and you don't know who owns what, or sometimes can be very dedicated uh, as spaces of isolation or exclusion that you know neighborhood folks don't participate in, or there's a perception that they can't. Um, but each of those spaces, and often all of the, all of those spaces, um, hold um, artifacts of memory, commemoration, identity, history, uh, either um, uh, or could be spaces for. Uh, history lost and are sometimes spaces of history erased. So kind of just pushing back into this conversation because I'm just curious about it. Um, are there opportunities for mayors to do different type of work with their academic institutions or you know institutions of higher learning or maybe it's your healthcare kind of is your anchor institution as it relates to the public realm infrastructure? the design of it, the building of it, the who it's for, how to make it more inclusive, you know, could it be the radical space of belonging? And how can the kind of scholarship side of universities be a part of helping to create, um, fill in the gap of history and narrative mm -hmm. such that it's not always a, a either or, but it is a, an expansion of the inclusiveness of the American history that we need to be telling stories about. That's just my point of view, which people can push back on. Um, so other opportunities for collaborating on public realm infrastructures with your anchor institutions and then the role they can actually play in helping to fill in the gap on narrative. Uh, okay, so for Tony's students, do you always feel like you could answer with like three hours of conversation? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a lot in there. I, I you know, what, what jumps to mind for me is, is um, so Madison is a city on an isthmus. Right, we, we are, our downtown is surrounded by uh, lakes on two sides, and 
Um, the sort of iconic center of Madison um, is State Street, which runs from the, the State Capitol building, which is an incredible building. If you um, ever have the chance to go there, I strongly recommend. But State Street runs from the Capitol to the university. And so on one end, you have this huge classical architecture, dome, beautiful building. Then you have this um, retail shopping street. And then you have a, um, a hill that has uh, leads up to a statue of um, President Lincoln sitting um, on a chair. And, and that is so, like, that is people's experience of Madison, right? And when you say Madison, people think of State Street. And, um, and when George Floyd was murdered, the thing that happened was that uh, people came to State Street and they broke literally every glass window on the street. <coughs> and I won't even get into all of where that led to, but one of the things that came out of the conversations was that that street, those places were welcoming um, on one end to the people who work for the state, and on the other end, to UW students. And nowhere in between were they welcoming to particularly young people of color from the community. And so that dynamic and that wrestling and what we have had to think about and do since then um, has really brought a lot of stuff to the surface. Um, and that's a you know, it's a difficult, uncomfortable, but really rich conversation about space and place and who feels comfortable where. And um, one of the things that has happened, which um, I think is, is powerful and speaks to a lot of the themes that we are talking about here, um, is there is a, um, a sculptor who works for the university, who's a professor at the university, um, who has created a really beautiful sculpture that stands in dialogue with Lincoln, right. um, closer to the Capitol than to the um, campus, and it's a um, it's African American man sitting in a barber's chair, very much in the same posture as Lincoln, and it's just a it's a beautiful example of art provoking conversation and being in dialogue with other art and um, and the space around it and it you know it's one of the things that gives me hope yeah. thank you for that you know when I, when I think about that relationship between us and let's say Virginia Commonwealth University when we already have a product from our partnership mm -hmm. that's created a very inclusive space mm -hmm. welcoming space mm -hmm. for every Richmonder, but also every student and uh, member of, uh, of the VCU community as well. And it's uh, what we call Monroe Park, where it's surrounded by all academic buildings, essentially, uh, and is the, uh, I think, one of the best parks we have in the city. There was a lot of back and forth with the community to, to get it renovated because this was also a place that was where the homeless would would go for shelter, but also for for food and sustenance as well. But the, what we've created today, and I just had a, we just had an event there for Richmond Black Restaurant Week, where this is a park that's used by everyone, mm -hmm. all walks of life. And I remember saying to the president of the university, like, we need to create more spaces mm -hmm. like this, where you can't tell the difference between when you go from city into university, and and VCU is it's intertwined into the city, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of uh, universities. So there's no campus you for per se it's a part yeah. of the city on the scholarly end though i'm grateful for the relationship we have with virginia union because remember i told you about how richmond was the second busiest domestic slave port in the united states mm -hmm. well right in the footprint of that uh of that neighborhood where was the the center of the slave trade is a place called lumpkin's jail devil's half acre mm -hmm. uh, we've created essentially a heritage campus in this in this zone in uh, a downtown adjacent neighborhood called Shaco Bottom it was there at this jail that the the the, the husband was notorious mm -hmm. as a uh, uh, he was a slave jailer mm -hmm. but the wife when she inherited the property upon his death created this space for the education of black men, 
which became Virginia Union University. Oh, wow. And so as we talk about how do we uh, memorialize that this was the center of the slave trade, we know that Virginia Union is a part of that story. And they have to be at the table because we can't tell the story without telling what it was the creation from something so horrific. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we, a couple of times it's been mentioned about the benefits of having the resources of a university and the University of Maryland in particular, the, it's called the Maryland Institute of Technology and the Humanities, I think I'm getting it right, uh, has been working with the Lakeland Community Heritage Project uh, to, to preserve the stories and maintain and, and dem you know, d depict, dis display the, the story of Lakeland to the residents, to, to the public at large. Uh, um, and the community, the Lakeland community, especially people who were around, uh, who lived through urban renewal, who who knew what Lakeland was like before urban renewal, uh, are are aging. Uh, so we in the Lakeland Community Heritage Project really wanted to make sure that that history is preserved. One of the uh, one of the things that the Lakeland community really wants to make sure that we do in this restorative justice process is is to make sure that people understand that history. I talked about Lake Artemisia before, and it really is a remarkable, beautiful place, um, but has this fraught history of having once been a residential neighborhood that was decimated. Uh, so p the people that go there to, to run, bike, uh, enjoy the lake, uh, they they don't know that unless they do their unless they go online and do their research. So one of the things that we really want to do in thinking about public public space is how do we how do we how do we mean how do we uh, d show that how do we help people understand that how do we how do we create presentations and displays of, of that history so that people uh, people who come there know that 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 there is this history there. Yeah. Questions from our audience. Questions online. Uh, one Jiko is up top. And did I have one here as well? Hi, mayors. Thank you so much um, for sharing about your cities and and being really honest about the struggles <coughs> of your cities. Um, I have a particular connection with Richmond uh, because in Stephen Gray's class last year, I had the chance to explore a project known as Bridge Park um, that is in the works uh, and in conversation there. And I just wanted to know, hear a little bit more um, from any mayor, honestly, how you think about what are kind of the more innovative ways you can move resources from the city when a project, like a future project like the Linear Park or Bridge Park does come into your city and into a community and does change the kind of real estate and financial situation, land value. What are more innovative ways that you can move resources into those communities that tend to experience those impacts more directly? Um, and how are you thinking about that at this moment? Thank you. Well, that's, that's the question, isn't it? I mean, I feel like all of us have, um, through this course, are wrestling um, and, and with that question and asking that question in different ways. Um, you know, I, I can talk a little bit about what we're thinking about in Madison. Um, and some of it's obvious, right? Some of it's, you know, your sort of more traditional value capture uh, options. Um, but uh, we've really been thinking a lot about um, as we invest in neighborhoods, as particularly as we invest in transportation infrastructure, um, in both acquiring key parcels of land so that we're in control of what happens to them and we can um, use them to create affordable housing um, and not just let the market drive the housing costs, um, but also thinking about using the tools of, of zoning and zoning overlays and um, you know, and and this is, you know, it's, it's a it's something to wrestle with because we're a city that it, that is in desperate need of more housing, and so on the one hand, we're trying to um, use all the tools we have on the zoning side to allow the creation of more housing, and frankly, any type of housing, like just give me more units, right? Um, and on the other hand, we want to be very mindful about 
uh, you know, our ability to make sure that some of that housing is affordable. And because we're in Wisconsin, we have very few tools to do that. And so there's a tension there around, do you just allow a lot of things through zoning? And then how do you make sure that that, that ends up being affordable? So that's a whole conversation that we could have. Um, uh, someone has a question about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the other things that I, I that we've I feel like we've really been talking about, and I don't know that I have answers around, um, are about how do you if the market is changing, how do you make sure that people who have been around for a long time um, are able to make choices about how they benefit from that. And so I have thought a lot in the past about enabling housing choice, right? Enabling multiple different types of housing so people can choose the kind of place they want to live in in any given neighborhood. But now I'm thinking also about, um, you know, is this an opportunity for wealth generation for people and how do you empower that? Um, and also, how do we think about the presence um, and continued presence of businesses and nonprofits and institutions in these neighborhoods as land values go up and thus rent goes up? And so there's a, there's a lot there. I haven't really answered your question, but um, it, you know, the the final thing I'll say is that um, you know we are uh, South Madison is is the historic black neighborhood in Madison. And people feel very strongly about this. Um, and we just completed a planning process around South Madison. That's a whole class in and of itself. Um, it, but the, one of the things that we are doing um, in an attempt to address what you're talking about is really partnering with and investing in existing nonprofit institutions in South Madison. And um, that means a lot of different things, but in many cases it looks like a little bit of money and a lot of staff time um, to support the creation of new buildings um, and new opportunities in those buildings. I want to I want to I want to see if um because I think you did answer some of the question, but I also want to see if there's two ways to answer the question, which you've touched upon. If I think I'm understanding Wajiko's question, because she is just coming out of my gentrification course, since so I know that's kind of in her head. Um, and there is I a, thought that was a gentrification uh, question. It, yes. <laughs> yeah, she didn't she say, didn't say it, the G but word, she wrapped up every other description around it. <laughs> and there is a question in the chat I'm going to read in a second that helps us get back to the housing choice question. But before I do that, I think I want to lean into the part of your question that I think may have been about um, the resource allocation part that addresses that. And this brings me back to something we started in the first panel and we've talked about in the course that was teed up for us in February when we had USDOT on. Right, and all, all leading up to the way in which the current administration has been asking us to think differently about infrastructures. So if the funding stream is just coming down, it's a roadway project, fix the roads, or it's a transit project, run a BRT, the question is sort of saying that's gonna create a ripple effect, yeah. right? So how might the federal government bundle funding such that we know the ripple effect is going to have an effect on it and I need money for that too? How can I put a package together that says, hey, fund this because A, B, and C are connected, give the money to address it now? And, and my sort of thinking is how can I get the federal government to start thinking about that? And or do I need the federal government to signal that so that maybe when I'm writing this, you know, spending limited staff resources to write these grant applications, I can use that same application to go to funding, to look at capital sources, to begin to create the capital stack of funding that helps me address the integrated problem and not just the you know, specific thing that is going to have an impact, but it isn't addressing the things that it's attached to. Was that a little bit of your question too? Okay. <laughs> so let's go to the, like, the actual 
impact of the question, and I'm going to add this question in from the chat, which is, and maybe one, one of the other mayors would like to take a stab at the housing part of this, which is, can you share any university efforts to alleviate the pressures they place on local affordable housing stock? So hmm. in your work with your local um, anchor institution, have you seen them be successful in alleviating pressures or are they, uh, let's put it this way, can you share anything they're attempting to do to alleviate the pressures? And then there's another, I see the <laughs> up at the top corner. That, that is a difficult question to answer, Absolutely. I will say. But we wouldn't come to Harvard if we didn't think we we're going to get difficult questions, right? <laughs> um, they know you're up for it. So as we know that um, I, I know of the fights that have occurred here in Boston and Cambridge as well over university uh, university construction and development, which leads, to, these are all tax exempt properties, which means that these real estate tax dollars, property tax dollars, don't end up back in the general fund, all right? Which essentially robs the community of tax revenue. And so the university in my city has been working on how do we develop some of these properties through a private developer, right? And we, we are doing, a, we're doing a, a project together already in downtown, our downtown core, where there's a private developer coming in. They are the tenant, right? They're the tenant, and so we can re reap some of the tax benefits from this construction. And they're doing the same thing on some of, they've done it already on a couple of their student housing properties as well. And uh, I think that's a way for universities to be uh, helpful, um, and I want to just, can I just go back to that last question? Sure. And you know, we got a couple projects in Richmond where, for instance, we're having a, a north-south trail, uh, the match for the east-west trail that we already have, that's gonna go through like five localities. And it's gonna go th right through the heart of downtown Richmond, but also gonna go right into an area which has been underserved in the past. Now we know when this trail goes through this part of Southside that more and more folks are gonna say, hey, I wanna live next to the trail. Mm -hmm and more properties are likely to come out of the ground, how do we get a package together, a policy package together to incent developers to build more affordable housing? And also, how do we get the zoning right so they actually can uh, create more dense housing as well? These are the sort of things that we have to think about. We can't just say, we're gonna do this project and we're gonna forget about the rest. But believe it or not, that has been the case in the past. Right? We're going to lay down this road, we're going to lay down this trail, we're going to create this BRT, and we'll deal with the consequences, right. you know. We need to start dealing with them. There has to be a package. Time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'll just start by saying. I have one last question in the back. So, Michael, you can head up there, and we'll have Mayor Wahan answer this question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start by noting that in terms of general affordable housing, um, I actually think we're making a lot of progress right now, and it's great. We're, we, um, the, the, the county, Prince George's County, uh, where we're located in, ha, uh, has committed to, as part of a regional effort, to to build 70,000 new housing units, and by, 20, by 2030, 70% of those will be affordable. Uh, and But... Uh, which is great, but that doesn't address a, challenge, a real challenge that we have with affordable housing for students and for graduates, both undergraduate and graduate students. And uh, the level of housing insecurity, I, I, I think for students is not very well understood. Um, uh, it was actually a study out of the University of Wisconsin, I think, that recently talked about that, um, the, uh, uh, a survey of, of, uh, of students at two and four year institutions that showed the level of housing insecurity is just shockingly high. Uh, so we're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, the university has been really interested in pursuing affordable housing for grad students. There's a very limited amount of subsidized housing for grad students. Um, we, we have a general housing shortage that has really driven up the cost, which I think is what the, um, the question the, is. The question yeah. is about that came on uh, over the internet, over online. Uh, uh, and, we, and one approach has been to just build as many new units of student housing as possible, because there's a big market for it right now. But that's not, we've, we've, we've come to recognize that that is not getting at the problem to the level that we need to. So um, the, the state of Maryland just put uh, $10 million aside for affordable grad student housing. Uh, we're looking at engaging with Enterprise Community Partners, which is a national nonprofit, to, to help us figure out the crack the student housing challenge um, because there really aren't any good resources out there to, to do it and we recognize that just trying to address the market demand isn't isn't doing it okay so we're gonna, we have a question last question up top 
And a last question online, and then we'll give you each the opportunity to answer one of them. Yes, sir. Great. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Ben Bolger. I'm a GSD alum, and uh, I went to undergrad at Michigan, a great uh, college town in Ann Arbor, and I previously taught in Williamsburg at William & Mary, another great uh, Virginia college town. Um, when COVID hit, uh, there was a de-densification in Cambridge and everywhere else in college towns. People went to Zoom. Hopefully, the pandemic is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but it revealed a great digital divide. Mm -hmm. Students that had to Zoom in places where they were unsafe or crowded and cramped, and it, it was a really serious issue. So what I'm wondering is, as we think about the physical infrastructure, mm -hmm. what can we do to think about the digital infrastructure? No doubt colleges will continue to expand digitally through online education, what have you. How do we build a digital infrastructure that addresses the digital divide, mm -hmm. but also continues to grow physically college towns and make them okay. uh, as great as they always should be? So digital divide, question number one. And then question number two is, what is the, do you see a difference in working with the, a private institution, a private university versus a public institution? So uh, pick one of those questions to respond to as your final remarks for us. Okay. Um, I just actually want to go back, Tony, to, to a question that you asked that, that we sort of uh, slid by and, and relate it to the digital divide question, uh, because you asked about federal funding. Yeah. And um, I think that that um, the Biden administration, I think, is doing a really good job of um, pushing more federal money direct to cities versus going through states, which I would always recommend as a mayor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also, I think that, that there's an opportunity. And this is some of this is happening, but there's an opportunity to uh, make some of the funding a little bit more flexible, at least in the sense that um, if it's funding an infrastructure project, that it can also fund um, the staff or consultant time around what let's just call um, you know communication, community engagement. Mm -hmm. um, Recognizing that that's those are fraught terms, and yeah. it, but um, but allowing the money to be spent on that, mm -hmm. um, and also um, allowing um, you know one of the things that that I think is a danger in the infrastructure money is that if we push too far towards only shovel-ready projects, you get projects that have been on the shelf for five right. years that weren't designed in a way that's equitable or climate friendly. And so can we use some of the money now to almost retrofit some of those designs to be more of what we mm -hmm. need? So I, that's just to, to say that I think that there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also more that we need with federal funding. And and I say this in relationship to the, the digital divide question because um, one of my great frustrations about, there, there are many, great frustrations that I have with the state of Wisconsin government, or let me say specifically the legislature, um, uh, is that that we have been, as cities, and, and also interestingly, the university has been preempted from playing any sort of um, central role in providing broadband access. We can't do a municipal broadband utility. The university, which once upon a time, actually played a very strong and important role in digital equity, had that power taken away by the legislature. And so we, as a state, really struggle to be able to provide um, an equitable approach to broadband for anyone, for, you know, for university students, for K-12 students, for low-income households, for rural households, like take your pick, right? We're, we're so dependent on the market because of the decisions that the legislature has made. And so, uh, you know, what do we do about that? We are working around every corner and through every crack we can, <laughs> um, but the real answer is a political answer, right? And I'm sorry to say that it actually comes back to, uh, you know, the maps and gerrymandering ultimately but um, you know I, I think that that we have to demand from our leadership at state and federal levels um, to not just empower for-profit companies and the market to provide but to recognize that if we really honestly want to serve everyone 
that ultimately is going to have to come back to government and to nonprofits. Mayor Stoney, the um, digital divide or public-private institution? I will, I'm going to take the public-private institution uh, question because I have both yep. in, 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 my, in my city. And, you know, I, I would say working with each is just about the same. Okay. Now, I, last year I, f I held my first uh, town and gown summit. Mm. And it was interesting seeing you get all the presidents in the room mm -hmm. and you talk about what we want to accomplish together. Uh, and then when you leave the room, though, people say like, oh, so-and-so wasn't here. <laughs> you need to talk to so-and-so. I was like, okay, all right. But so I find myself playing the role of, and that's the great role that the mayors play, I think, is that we're the, we have to be the grand convener. Mm -hmm. right? We have to facilitate. We may have our vision, but then there might be nine other different visions out there mostly on the same topic, how do we bring all the vision, all that together? And so uh, working with, whether it's University of Richmond and VUU and, and VCU and the, and the community college, J. Sergeant Reynolds, they're all working similarly on the same thing, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. How do we make that the general vision, though, of the entire, yeah. entire city and how they can play their role, right? And there's the thing. A lot of times they're duplicating efforts, and so I feel like I have to be the one to say, wait, wait a minute. Someone's already doing something on that. Why don't you invest your resources yeah. over here, you know, instead of all you, you all doing the same exact thing? Yeah. So less about the difference, more about getting them yes. on, and working together on the same page. Our last yeah. response. Sure. Uh, so I've never uh, dealt with a private institution, but one thing I'll say about working with a public institution is that I think it does, because they are a government institution, we do have other ways to to influence them. Uh, working with our uh, working with our general assembly, our representation, our our, um, our state government to to try to make sure that they are uh, that they are listening to the community and what the community needs. Uh, and let me just, I'll touch on, on the digital divide. Uh, I think one thing that, that we're looking at doing more is uh, we have a community center in College Park that's in Lakeland. Uh, we are looking at a potential new community center in North College Park. And I think that, that those uh, institutions and libraries uh, provide an, an opportunity for us to, to make sure that people have access uh, to to uh, digital technology, to to internet and broadband, it's been something that we've talked about a lot in in, in the during the COVID um, pandemic about uh, engaging with K through 12 kids, making sure that they have a place place to go. Um, uh, and it's not not ideal because it's not at home, but it does provide an, an an avenue and an opportunity for to help us address that. So if you too will give me the privilege of saying Patrick, Lavar, and Satya, thank you very much for this engaging panel. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, all thank the you. mayors. Thank you. NEA, U.S. Conference of Mayors, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and everyone who's helped bring this event to a beginning and a successful end. Thank you. Have a fantastic weekend. And safe travels.